The doors of the wild are wide open, and at the same time closed to civilization. Its landscapes are strewn with geographic obstacles, rivers and streams, lakes and oceans. Forests stand as guardians. Mountains rise up to intimidate and challenge anyone who approaches. And for those who have eyes to see, the wild reveals its treasures. It speaks volumes to those who dare venture through its doors, and then waits for our response. The Call of the Wild, what is it? Why are so many of us drawn to distant horizons? It's the call that in large part inspired the growth of America, the new world. Even today, because of the work and foresight of people like John Muir and Teddy Roosevelt, much of that wilderness remains. It offers wild places where one can retreat from civilization, reconnect with the creation and the creator, and find rest, meaning, and significance. To some, the wilderness is a frightening place to be avoided. For others, it offers adventure or creates a sense of peace in response to a beautiful and pristine wonderland. The wilderness of Alaska has been called the final frontier of North America. Most of it is wild. Alaska is so large and so formidable, outsiders are dwarfed by the landscape. Its wilderness overloads the senses. There's too much to take in. There are some who can help us see some who can help us bring into focus what we might otherwise miss. Oh, what a hit. Oh, it's a beautiful grayling. Oh, man. I think the grayling shouts Alaska, you know what I mean? It, it's got those big, look at that dorsal fin, it's all pink and blue, and it's got that silvery sheen. Maybe it's maybe maybe uh, you southern boys would say it's the the bluegill of the north, but I, I just love it. And it's a white flaky meat, and and uh, ten thousand eagles can't be wrong. They love them. Rocky McKelvin is a hunting and fishing guide, based at his lodge tucked along the Halitna River, southwest of Anchorage. As you look around you see that this is really the wild, remote part of Alaska. Alaska, believe it or not, has 14 what they would call big game animals. Uh, 14 from the uh, fox all the way up through the bison and uh, through the musk ox, uh, the grizzly, the polar bear, uh, black bear. Um, in our area, we have a lot of moose. Uh, we used to have a lot of caribou, but we got a lot of wolves and that took care of the caribou. Uh, birds, I mean, uh, all birds of prey, the osprey, the eagle, just incredible amounts of, uh, uh, it's the end of the flyway for ducks. And you can imagine, and the trumpeter swan has a seven foot wingspan. They mate for life, they're white, they're beautiful. So lots of, uh, of birds, 457 different kinds of birds and uh, uh, wildlife in Alaska. I grew up uh, in Alaska in the 50s and we had a beautiful garden. Uh, we had a river running right by the cabin 
We had moose and caribou in the hills, and that's how we lived, and that's how we survived. My dad used to say, Rocky, if the fishing's no good and the hunting's no good, the eating better be. And that's what we do. John, what's for lunch? We're having sandwiches. We have turkey and chicken salad or ham. And we have Alaska smoked um, king salmon dip. Eating in the wild, I guess, to me, means living off the land. Um, eating in the wild is, is catching fish and cooking it for dinner that night. Um, it means going to the garden and getting rhubarb from the garden for pie. It means getting potatoes from the garden, and it means making salad from the garden. Um, there's a lot of options. You have moose and caribou, and there's wild berries and um, blueberries and cranberries and um, cabbage, and it's just a, an endless um, variety, really. And so I have recreated in remote Alaska exactly how I grew up. And so we have the moose and the caribou and the bears and fish out of the river, a beautiful garden, and uh, we share that with others who would like that experience. Wow, Josh, how you doing, man? Unbelievable. Two big grizzlies sitting over there. You feel safe with that? Congratulations, Thanks. great Thanks. job. Thanks, Brandon. Brandon, nice. Thank you. Thank you. One job. night in the tent, one, night one morning in the shot, huh? Yeah, you yeah. bet. Wow. Rocky takes people deep into the Alaskan wilderness to fish, to hunt, to be alone without man-made distractions. Only by going alone in silence, without baggage, can one truly get into the heart of the wilderness. All other travel is mere dust, hotels, and chatter. People need wild places, whether or not they think they do. They need to experience a landscape that is timeless, whose agenda moves at the pace of ice ages. Wilderness puts us in our place. It reminds us that our plans are small and somewhat absurd. Presently, in the United States, there are 756 wilderness areas, almost 110 million acres. So how do we learn to see the wilderness for what it is? And what does the wilderness reveal about the character and nature of its creator? In the Bible, a man named Job suffers a series of terrible losses. He questions God's goodness and God eventually answers Job with questions of his own. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in a thicket? Who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wander about for lack of food? Job chapter 38. In his pain, Job had lost sight of the wisdom and power of God. But now, confronted by the author of creation, his eyes were opened. People can and do and willfully miss God's love and creation. They don't appreciate it for that. Uh, what they want out of creation is, is some self-gratification, not, not adoration. They want the biggest moose and they want the biggest caribou and they want the biggest fish. And, and yet I think at the same time, not to stop and just ponder the wonderful complex ways of God and creation. And, and that's the way I look at it. The water, the air, the food, everything that we have, that we are, that we breathe comes from a loving hand of God. To both the, the believer who wants to believe and see and to the non-believer uh, who will never see and will never believe. In the sanctuary of the wilderness, we're not the first to sense its wonder. In the Bible, the prophet Isaiah and King David both remind us that all created things reflect the power and wisdom of their creator. Even trees, 
rivers, and mountains respond to their maker. And the last book of the Bible, Revelation, describes a time when all creatures will worship God together. Every creature which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor, and glory and power, be to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, forever and ever. Revelation chapter 5. One of the things that the animals understand is that God loves them and takes care of them because he simply provides for the birds, he provides for the foxes. He even says that in scripture. The, the lilies are arrayed in beauty. And I've also noticed that man has forgotten that the greatest gift that God shows his love is through his creation. I don't care if you like organic foods or you shop at a, at a regular shopping center or grocery store. When you walk down those aisles, that's not from a farmer. That's a gift from God. He gave you the earth. He gave you the soil. He puts the water, the air that we breathe, the sunshine that grows things. And we have forgotten how to worship and love our God simply because we have forgotten to look at creation and thank Him and to be able to express the joy, the celebration that we are a, a part of the, the, the absolute thing that he loves the most. He loved us so much that he shed his blood for us, but he also gave us his earth and this world to take care of. Sometimes we experience God's creative power through pictures or words, but seeing the wilderness for ourselves can speak to us in unexpected ways. I uh, decided to take an extended vacation, a uh, sabbatical, you might call it, and I um, left uh, in February uh, and uh, it was just about nine months later in uh, November I came back home. I uh, traveled Started in Maine, went down the East Coast to Florida, crossed the South to California, up to Alaska, and then back down through the Rockies. Steve Mayer is a carpenter by trade whose hobby is to photograph nature. Through the eye of his camera's lens, Steve takes us to some of his favorite places. Florida, the Everglades, you know, that, uh, that's a, just a huge grassy river. They actually consider the whole thing a river. Um, and uh, you know, you get the, uh, the egrets and the alligators and things like that there. Um, then you move on to Texas, uh, Big Bend National Park. That's a very impressive place. It's a, um, it was hot, uh, desert uh, and mountains and, um, and beautiful in its own way. California coast, uh, Big Sur, just watching the whales out in the ocean and um, the, some of the seabirds and stuff were, were great there. The mountains, um, like the Olympic uh, Mountains, Olympic National Park, um, uh, North Cascades. Um, then you get up into Alaska and you've got the mountains again and then northern Alaska, vast, huge. You get up on a knoll and look out and you don't see any sign of humans anywhere. and wild and vast, big, it's just impressive. I sometimes think that uh, beauty is the, uh, the surest uh, evidence of God's goodness. You know, he, he uh, put beauty out there for us. I mean, it was, it's above and beyond uh, what we actually need. It's, uh, it's uh, superfluous. You can look at all the uh, interesting uh, interactions, the uh, complexities, and things like that. And um, you can actually explain them away scientifically. Um, I don't quite understand how you can do that with beauty, uh, with the beauty of creation. Why, why would God um, make the, the leaves turn so brilliantly in the fall when, uh, when they could just turn brown and drop off? I don't know, maybe you could argue that he made us to enjoy the colors rather than the colors for us to enjoy. And there were other times when I, I, I think of them as my take off your shoes and, and sing the doxology moments where you just really see that uh, God is there and God is uh, um, 
God made this beautiful, awesome, awesome world for us to enjoy. Yeah. I would get up uh, a lot of times before sunrise and uh, get out to some place and catch um, either the sunrise uh, itself or the, the early morning light, on, uh, whether it's a landscape or um, sometimes I'd, I'd get into a uh, place where I was looking for a particular bird or a particular animal. I had a lot of fun shooting uh, muskox when I was up there. Um, I just uh, got lucky and uh, uh, came upon uh, a herd of mus muskox uh, right along the road and uh, just uh, waited for them to wake up from their nap and, uh, and photographed them and uh, they, you know, they, they come so close and it, and it was so, um, I don't know, it was almost easy, almost too easy. I thought I saw some deer up here. Maybe we can catch up to them. without scaring them away. Okay. The key to shooting wildlife, I think, is finding wildlife that will tolerate your presence. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a big key. Um, also, patience is a big one. Um, you can't tell them how to pose. <laughs> and uh, you can't tell them to sit still. I guess there was a somewhat of a search for God in the wilderness. I was uh, looking for some very real, tangible signs of him out there. In the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans, he points to creation as a visible reflection of its invisible creator. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Romans chapter 1. So what is it about the natural world that shows us God's eternal power and divine nature? For openers, there's mathematical precision when I come out in the wilderness, what impacts me the most is, is seeing the creation and seeing how, how it's so divinely inspired and seeing how, how each thing is made with such thought by God that like they all, everything works together in such a beautiful way. And then like going back into an urban environment and seeing how there's such like discord um, within the people and within the buildings and, the, and like just how, how things don't mesh together in the same way they do here. Um, and just seeing how like if we were to follow the natural design that like God's given us, I think that that would, that would really change our urban environments. For me, um, coming into the wilderness is just being able to look around and see the peace and the harmony that is around us and just shows us God's beauty and His peace and um, the way He just orchestrates everything so perfectly to work together for us. Long ago, the prophet Isaiah saw the ability of the natural world to praise its creator. Shout for joy, O heavens. Rejoice, O earth. Burst into song, O mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. Isaiah chapter 49. It's really rejuvenating and it, it helps me to just like, it relieves a lot of anxiety and a lot of stresses because when like, especially at night, like when you sleep under the stars and you see like the, all of the stars and just like you imagine just the billions and billions of different galaxies and universes and you, you think of how far away they are and how what you're seeing is like 4,000 light years old or how, however old it is. It's just, it's crazy to, to be worried about a test or to be worried about, you know, like what you're gonna do in the next year or like what school you're gonna get into when there's, when there's that huge universe you know that you're being taken care of. One of the distinctive features of the wild is its complexity and never-ending cycles. In plants, in fish, in mammals, the balance of nature is all around us. I don't know of anything more wonderful and complex than going to this little creek right up here that we just went to knowing that in a few days there will be thousands of salmon there. And the river has that complexity where 
that fish then goes out into the estuaries and the bays of the oceans, and he gets to be about six to eight inches, and then he goes into a gyre, 3,000 miles all the way down past the Sakhalin Islands, Providenia, over to Alaska through the Bering Straits, San Francisco, all the way back around. Huge current of water, hundreds of thousands and millions of salmon swimming in that gyre, and four years go by. And that salmon in the middle of the ocean says, I want to go home. I want to go home. And how in the world does he find this place? Then they have to pass myriads of creeks and sloughs and other places. Hey, this, you know, why don't they, why didn't they spawn over there? Why do they go right there? I mean, the same spot they were. A year after year, same spot. The salmon performs an incredible miracle in the life of Alaska. And that is given to him by his creator through this water right here. Right here. Wow. That's pretty amazing stuff. We are the gardeners. We are the, the caretakers uh, since the first garden. And it's not with uh, abandonment. We're not out there in a moving train across the West, shooting thousands of buffalo. We are very careful on managing our great uh, gift, this wonderful gift of the wildlife. And we put a lot of time and a lot of effort into being good stewards of what God has given us. We know that uh, to take a female from the water is, is to really affect uh, the population. So we, if we have, if we keep fish, a few fish that we could keep, we keep the males and that are, are going to die anyway, and uh, we uh, take care of the females. And that's the way it should be, guys. I mean, we've gone about a hundred miles up the river to our uh, remote upper river camp, and it's real gravelly and we're uh, looking for a little different species of fish here. We're fishing for char and grayling, beautiful fish. Uh, and uh, it's just a comfortable kind of a fish day. Oh, whoa, but I love it uh, because you're not working big pike and uh, big salmon. You're just out fishing for fun. I think women really enjoy this kind of experience. Um, and these fish are absolutely beautiful. These grayling have this uh, iridescent, we'll call it the uh, southern pinky chin or the brim. <laughs> and they have that big pink and blue dots on the dorsal fin. What was God thinking there? Man, that's beautiful. Great eating fish, a very sensitive uh, fish to the environment. And we really try to take good care of these fish. Just let her go, do her thing really what we like. We like grayling, but we really like those big char. Oh, baby, come to mama. Woo! I can't tell you how true it is when I go out and I look at a sunset or a sunrise or walk in a park. It doesn't have to be Alaska, but I can acknowledge that God created this and he is sovereign and he is holy. And uh, it is uh, astounding. It is, it is a, a time of joy. It's a time that you can truly worship God. The call to a place that is so different from our own artificial environments is a call to the wilderness, a place that is both inviting and imposing, secluded and yet revealing. And to those who respond, the invitation is to see as we've never seen before, to look, and then to look again, to keep on looking until something becomes clear, until the whole and the parts come into focus. Here everything works together in wonder. The changing moods are more than inspirational. They're spiritual. But only for those who have eyes to see, for those who want to see, for them, the wild speaks. It speaks volumes about itself, about ourselves, and about the wonder 
of our Creator. Today, as in the past, the noise and busyness of the city can distract us from what really matters. But in the solitude of the wilderness is a silent invitation to unexamined lives. Only by going alone in silence, without baggage, can one truly get into the heart of the wilderness. All other travel is mere dust, hotels, and chatter. Some answer the call of the wild for its beauty and adventure. Others come here for what they can leave behind. In the wilderness, the sounds and rhythms change. In the emptiness, the wonder, and the silence, the cycle of distractions can be broken. As we enter the wilderness, we leave behind computers and microwaves, ease of transportation, busy schedules and interruptions, traffic, billboards, electricity, and all of the conveniences and clutter that normally controls our lives and does our thinking for us. You leave them behind a lot of the comforts. If you want to get out into the true wilderness um, without any facilities, you won't have the big comfy bed. It's liable to get cold, liable to get hot, and uh, you just, uh, you have to adjust to that rather than have your environment adjusted to you. Steve Mayer is a carpenter who spent nine months traveling from Maine to Florida to California to Alaska and Colorado. He wanted to experience the wilderness and to follow his interest in photographing nature. Our national parks generally are made to be accessible for people. And so they do have the roads and uh, you can get in in relative comfort. Uh, but if you really wanted to uh, actually get out into wilderness, you really got to leave some of that comfort behind. Um, you got to um, get out to areas that aren't made for people. I was in the Arctic uh, in Alaska and in Canada. It's the wildness, it's the untameness of it and the, and the huge, the bigness of it. it. Really made an impression on me. Rocky McKelvin is a hunting and fishing guide along the Holitna River, two hours by small plane from Anchorage, Alaska, and urban life. And it seems like there's just a incredible fascination uh, with Alaska. Always has been, from Robert Service to the gold fields to the trappers and the miners and look at all the adventures that come up here. I mean, people come up here to run from something or to find something or to, to create something, to build something. People go all over the world to catch a 2040, 20 pound, 40 inch pike. We had a man here one time that had gone to eight different lodges, Canada, Russia, and he called me up and he said, can I get a 2040? And I go, yeah, you can get a 2040. And so he came up and the first day, he got a hold of a big old pike. The pike was even gray. And uh, caught it, pulled it, it actually pulled the boat around, it was so big. The biggest one we've caught here is 53 inches. Can you imagine? Like this, they're like, they're like crocodiles. And uh, so he pulls it in the boat, he sits down, we measured, it's well over 20 pounds, it's well over 40 inches. And he sat and he cried like a baby, just cried. Wow. We definitely have a lot of type A executives that are so used to controlling their whole environment and everything that they do. Um, 
And so when they first get out here, we've had some that have, you know, just wanted to take control and they want to, I mean, they, they go, well, you know, with the rain, you know, why can't we go out and do this? Why can't we do that? And it just takes them a little while to realize that there's some things they just can't control. They want fish now. They want moose now. I want my bear now. I want, and all of a sudden the adventure and the process and the journey doesn't make any more sense. It, it, somehow we've lost that. You can't control the fish or the runs or the bear or the moose or the caribou. And uh, you just enjoy the journey. You can't get out and nobody can get to you, you know? You feel like, okay, I can come here and unwind and relax and maybe not be myself, but more find who I am. You know, the problem with people going out in the woods and finding themselves is most of the time they don't like who they find, you know? I would say it's, it's getting away from all of the technology. We, we become so dependent on that to busy ourselves. And there's something about coming out here, you have a chance to really be still mm. and, and know that there is a God. And um, we see that quite often. I mean, just even when they're out fishing and sometimes when they, they're not even catching, they're, they're, they're just out there fishing. Just waiting on the Lord is a lost art. And I think that nature restores that. It's quite a river, isn't it? This, this is something awesome. A lot of guys, they'll fish three or four hours, put the pole down, go back to camp, and just sit by the campfire and, and talk. You know, just, just want to talk. You know, women say, uh, I can never get my husband to say a word. He won't talk to me at all. I say, hey, put him in a boat. He won't shut up. Talks all day. And we have a man here this week that's taken each of his children when they graduate on any trip they want to. And his son read the book while I'm in Wild Alaska and said, this is where we're going, Dad. And Tom and Tillman are here, uh, the greatest adventure of his lifetime. And here they have 12, 14 hours a day to communicate. Who gets that with their senior high? Yeah. I mean, it just doesn't happen. And uh, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that it's a great place to reconnect because they are so disconnected from their own world. Gotta be a good fish over there. It looks too good. Ooh. I see a big king in there. When they get here, it's like a, a it's an awe moment. And they get to be restored and refreshed uh, simply by getting away from the busy, hectic, workaday schedule and all of the issues that go on in providing and protecting in their environment. And I'm sure in their environment, they're in total control. But out here, no one's in control. You look at Jesus, every, every time he wanted to get away, he went to the mountains or a lake or he went up in the desert or he went out to a garden. He, he, he knew the outdoors was God's clothing, God's care, God's love. And, and that's the way I look at it. Sonny McKelvin is one of four daughters who spend six weeks every summer with their parents, helping at the lodge and serving the guests. At first, I thought it was a hindrance because I was like, what, no summer, you know, like, leave all my friends. But I think maybe it was this year when I really realized how much good it's actually done me. Um, it helped me grow as a person. It's really, it's given me a work ethic more than anything. Um, and it's, it's taught me a lot about helping other people and having more of a servant's heart. I've noticed that when my kids come out here every year, we've been part of doing this for 26 years, and so my girls, I have four girls, and they don't know anything else but Alaska and, and working and serving men as they come up here and families, and, and it's amazing to me how connected to their friends and phones and iPods and computers and cell phones uh, they are 
and how incredibly different they become after a month here. They like to talk. They like to sit around in the evening and share something that they're doing or creating or making or painting. They're different girls. Actually, it really helps you realize what your family is really important. It really like sets your standards straight when you come up here. One family that was renewed and reunited in the Alaskan wilderness was the Hadleys. They needed a fresh start. The family picture wasn't really all smiles when they arrived. I met a wonderful family uh, last year, and uh, Jim Hadley and Mike and his brother. I went to Russia with, um, with Mike, and we had the greatest time. And then years later, he heard that I had a fishing and hunting outfit up here, and uh, so he got his whole family to come. And uh, there was so much tension in the family. The idea to get away from their busy and separate lives came from John Hadley. He brought all of his sons and grandsons to Alaska. Thirteen men and boys came together, hoping for some fun and adventure. But what they got was a lot more. Rocky, he calls Alaska and the other Bible, because you can see God, you know. You can really see God up there, that's for sure. You know, the boys, being with my boys too, it's, you know, I'd never been anywhere where you could really just be with the boys and uh, the camaraderie and, and the closeness. And uh, you get to see the Lord everywhere and everything that, that happened up there. John, and especially his son, Mike, weren't sure what to expect when they agreed to trade their comforts for the wild. It's more like, a, am I gonna get eaten by mosquitoes? Are we gonna survive this? Is anyone gonna drown? Is there gonna be bears? And you know, we're coming out of the city and going into the wild. It's, it's not like just going up to Tahoe. It was like, it's real wild. You know, there's no one you can call if there's a problem, you know, so. I think that um, there, was a, there was an anticipation, but a nervous anticipation. Mike and his son, Nate, had a rocky relationship. Much of it related to Mike's divorce. And Mike knew that his son was really struggling. I looked forward to that when I knew that he said yes to going. And, uh, and I go, hey, I'm gonna be up there for a week with my son. And, um, you know, our relationship was strained to say the least. We, uh, you know, we were cordial with each other but didn't see each other much and a lot of struggles from our, uh, our past, uh, a divorce, uh, just, just struggles. He was, in a, he was in a desert and I was in a desert because he was in a desert. Really up until the last year when we were here for a week, I had a really rocky relationship with my father for a long time. You know, right away it was here I'm with my son, and so uh, we kind of just stuck to group stuff. But we were alone in a, in a cabin, me and him and my other son Caleb. So um, there was no hiding that there was going to be something happen in this relationship. Just the question was what. The last night I couldn't get him to go to bed. He's 23 years old. I'm like, come to bed, son. Come to bed. It's about two in the morning. Of course, it's still light up there. I says, well, what's the matter? Why won't you go to bed? And so I sat up and talked, and he said, he said, Daddy, he goes, I don't want this to end. He said, for, for two years I've been sitting around thinking I'm nothing, that I'm a nobody. And I've come up here, and, and I've seen God in, in creation and um, in our family experience, and, and I know that God is real, and I know that I'm not nothing. And he knew the Lord, but he was in a desert. And um, getting up there reminded him that no matter how work's going or your life going is going or your family is going, that God loves you. There's just so many things that get in the way of living the way that God intended us to live. And up here, there's none of that. You just you can grow so much closer to him and it, you can really become a lot better person, really. It's 
amazing just like what one week out here did for me and him personally. So it's, a, it's so much, so much better now and mm. it really, really did all stem from this. I got to actually just watch God heal my life in a way that I didn't really, I don't get any credit for, you know. He just did it, you know, and, and it's, and my son's relationship and mine is, I love you and I love you too, Dad. You know, it's back to that. And it had been, you know, six years uh, of not hearing that and, and dealing with that, so. Well, they fell in love with the outdoors and they were great fishermen and outdoorsmen. And they fell in love with the Creator and they also fell in love with each other again. Changed the whole family. I mean, the whole family dynamic is, is unbelievable. My dad says it's the greatest thing he's ever done. And he's, you know, 70 years old and has been nothing but a giving, loving father and Christian man. And that's, he feels that's the greatest, apart from my mother and his family, the greatest thing he's ever done with his money and his life. That's, that's pretty powerful from my father. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Psalm 19. I've known people that uh, have worked at the entrance to Yosemite, and people drive up, and they're in a hurry, and they say, well, what is there to do here, really? <laughs> you got a good golf course? You got tennis courts? You got a skating rink? You know? Anything really to do here? And, and when we bring that mindset, we're not going to see anything. You know, I think the figure is that 90% of the people that visit Yosemite and perhaps our other national parks never actually leave their cars except perhaps to walk into a visitor center or use the facilities, dive into a, a carpinteria. So it's called a windshield experience. Every summer, Paul Willis, professor at Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California, takes his students on a 12-day hike in Yosemite National Park. He has the group read the writings of John Muir and the Bible. As they do, they experience together the spirituality and rhythm of the wilderness, apart from city life. Most people are on the world, not in it, have no conscious sympathy or relationship to anything about them, undiffused, separate, and rigidly alone, like marbles of polished stone, touching but separate. A lot of the wilderness we have in California and our national parks and indeed the whole nation are, are there partly because of the, the work and the writing of a man named John Muir who lived mostly in the 19th century. Muir set out on a walk from uh, Indiana to Florida, a thousand miles as a young man, right after the Civil War. People asked him, what he was doing, it seemed an odd thing to do. And he said, well, I'm just following the teaching of Christ. I'm considering the lilies as Christ asked us to in the Sermon on the Mount. So he knew his scripture, he was good at twisting it a little bit, and yet John Muir has helped focus our attention on the natural world, uh, which he regarded as God's world in some sense, in a way that few writers or thinkers ever have. There is a love of wild nature in everybody, an ancient mother love ever showing itself, whether recognized or no, and however covered by cares and duties. I guess when I think about reading John Muir, I think of what Augustine said, that all truth is God's truth, wherever it may be found. And I think Muir pushes us towards a truth of looking to living in the creation in a way we might not tend to do in these times. So part of, of coming to know God better is having ourselves broken down to a point where we can see things clearly. And the wilderness does that by, by chipping away at the parts of ourselves that we build up uh, for the benefit of other people to, to look a certain way or to act a certain way. 
And coming out here really just breaks down those walls and helps us to become a person who can see. You know, you can go on a hike and you can just be walking, like getting to, from point A to point B and, you know, looking at the view and walking back down. But I think the more time you spend in nature and and the more you learn to look around and to, to like look at the details, like really how everything is working together um, and how everything is, is designed. If you come out into the wilderness with, with too much and, and you're here for selfish reasons or um, in a way that's not pleasing to God, you can totally miss uh, who God is and how he's revealed himself in creation. Walk away quietly in any direction and taste the freedom of the mountaineer. Camp out among the grasses and gentians of glacial meadows, in craggy garden nooks full of nature's darlings. Climb the mountains and get their good tidings. Nature's peace will flow into you as sunshine flows into trees. The winds will blow their own freshness into you and the storms their energy, while cares will drop off like autumn leaves. As age comes on, one source of enjoyment after another is closed but nature's sources never fail. So we need this connection to the creation as we more and more live in the shopping malls and the suburbs and our mega churches. You know, have we walled ourselves off from part of what God is speaking to us? You just have to have a little bit of self-discipline almost to take the time out of your busy schedule to just really appreciate and just slow yourself down and become silent and just listen and look around and you have to actively be seeking out God and listening for God when you're out in the wilderness. You know, if you've got your headphones in and you're talking on your cell phone or things, you're not going to find God out here. You really have to be able to quiet your heart and your mind and everything and just really appreciate what's out here. John Muir said, everyone needs beauty as well as bread. Places to play in and places to pray in. And I think that sums up what wilderness can be for us. It can be recreational, can be a place of adventure. I think some of my most adventurous moments in life have been on the peaks of the Sierra and the Cascades and in Alaska. But some of, the, some of the moments in my life where I've felt closest to God have been quiet moments in the wilderness as well. And I think it offers both to us. I like that word dwell. We don't do a lot of dwelling. We do a lot of uh, driving about, helter-skelter, uh, being nowhere very long. See, the idea of being somewhere for a while and soaking it in, I think is good, good for all of us. Admittedly, we don't all have the means or opportunity to experience the wilderness of Alaska, or even a visit to some of our state or national parks. But the principle of the wilderness and what solitude and wonder can renew in us is so important that it's worth doing whatever we can, wherever we can, even if it's to, to pause and to observe a tree or a leaf or a single flower, to be reminded in that moment of the Creator, the Creator who reveals Himself in the wonder of the wilderness.